cases, or some at least some case presentations. Uh, and so we're going to begin, I guess, we're going to have Mark go first. Yes. Thank you. Well, Dr. Jones had asked me to talk about active versus anatomic fixation, and I spent two days trying to figure out what am I going to talk about <laughs> in 2014. And so if I could have my slides up, please. So we, we used to see that, uh, you know, a few years ago, particularly with the Anorex device, but quite frankly, we just haven't seen that that much uh, anymore with the current technology and the anchoring and the suprarenal stand attachments and so forth. And then, of course, we had to remedy to this with all these techniques that were time consuming, and, uh, but we used to be able to usually get a secondary intervention with some good outcome. But quite frankly, in 2014, migration of stand grafts is reporting less than 1% with all the devices across. And uh, uh, patient selection, really, and preoperative planning is key to making sure that you avoid these type of complications. So this is the end of my talk for active migration. <laughs> so then Dr. Jones had asked me, well, maybe can you present a case? And I said, yeah, of course, I can present a case. So this is the case I'm presenting. This was a 78-year-old man who um, has a complex juxtarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. And I've been following this man for about three years. And he was at 5.2, and he was at 5.6. And we didn't have any options you know, to really treat this guy at the time. Plus, he had severe COPD, had coronary artery disease. And our vascular surgeons uh, didn't want to operate on him. Uh, he even went to out of state, you know, to try to seek some help, and he was told, you know, you should probably wait until your aneurysm reaches 6, 6.5, and then uh, maybe we'll just operate on you. But he, he was really a poor surgical risk. And the issue with him um, is that his SMA and the right renal arteries were like within three millimeters of each other. And so he was not a candidate for a fenestration with two renal fenestrations and a scallop. And so as we debuted this, you know, and I had the Cook people look at this, and we decided to actually sacrifice one of the renal arteries and uh, do a fenestration for the SMA and for the left uh, renal artery. So he was consented for that. And you can actually see on the on the right side, the, the, the CT, that it was very close proximity. So the graft came, and uh, as I was reviewing all that data, I thought, well, may, maybe there's a way to actually preserve that right renal artery. So we had the graft in-house, you know, two fenestrations, one for the SMA, one for the left renal, and then we were going to obliterate, you know, cover the right renal just because anatomically, and in, from an engineering standpoint, it was not possible to manufacture that graft because of the relationship. So, Dr. Jones, I, do you have any, uh, how would you do this? Do you have any, have you ever seen that? I'm sure you have eventually, right? These kind of complex. Certainly, we've seen more than our share of this type of uh, complex pathology. And over the past, I think we started our program back in 2002, so, uh, over probably about 14 years, I worked directly with a uh, uh, very, very experienced uh, senior uh, uh, vascular surgeon. And we probably would have tackled this case uh, with a, uh, in a hybrid fashion by doing a bypass from the external iliac on the left side, swinging that up, retroperitoneal approach uh, into that SMA and then uh, managing the renal arteries, uh, again, your institution with the fenestrated graft, because um, that takes the SMA out of the loop, 
uh, or uh, we can just snorkel those renals. Uh, and uh, I've been impressed in our sur surgeon's hands how quickly he can get up uh, that retroperitoneal to the SMA uh, with a relatively uh, low risk surgical procedure. Yeah, you know, we looked into that. We looked at the debranching, and we had the, the surgeons look into this, and they thought that his risks were so high, plus they don't really have a lot of experience like you have in your center. And, you know, they may have done like three or four a year. It's not like they do a lot. And they felt that the, the risk of doing the debranching procedure was the same as the risk of doing the intraoperative repair. So they, that, that's what they had said. And I'm not a surgeon, so I can't really attest to that. But Dr. Crazier, do you, do you have any? Uh, yeah, so uh, we've seen a lot of those. I have done over 600 aneurysms, unfortunately. So uh, I, I would have put an aortic cuff to extend the aneurysm upward. Uh, and then I would, uh, you can have two options, get the, both renals downward uh, or upward and the SMA chimney, basically. Uh, if I go upward, what I do is uh, I have a bilateral um, a brachial cut down approach and I'll use a eight French uh, uh, shuttle select and through that you can get uh, two devices to the renals and then the other brachial will be just for the SMA. So that's how I do it. So to, to, to chimney this, you know, we would have had to chimney the renals and the SMA. We would have needed, I mean, uh, and we, right. we, we, we thought do, we about do that. We do that quite frequently. But then I thought that maybe having the fenestrated graft and occluding the right renal may have been a better option. And it's hard to, it's hard to know, but that's the way we were heading. Until the, the day before, I had the idea that I want to show you here. So I came from above and I catheterized the right renal artery and then uh, we actually used that fenestrated endograft, and you can see the fenestration for the left renal and the fenestration for the SMA, and uh, we were able to, to do this, but from the, the right renal, we just snorkeled the right renal. So in this way, we, we used the, you know, the fenestrated graft, and we just ended up having one, one snorkel. And uh, the result was really good, and he's supposed to stop uh, two weeks, uh, you know, showed that the, 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 there was no leak, and uh, here's the uh, 3D, uh, you know, sort of. So we think we got away with it, and of course the, the, the follow-up is, is going is to be important. But I was looking at the literature to see if people have done snorkels with fenestrated endographs, and I couldn't, couldn't find anything. I thought it was a good option for him. I think you're right, um, and as I recall reviewing the literature as well, I've not seen this reported at all. Um, usually it's a scenario of the debate between uh, snorkel EVAR versus, um, you know, the um, uh, fenestrated EVAR. So now you've created a new phenomenon of the hybrid snorkel fenestrated EVAR. <laughs> Did you see that, Dr. Dietrich? Have you ever run into that? pretty uh, clever. Uh, what basic graft did you use? The Cook, the Cook endograft. Yeah, yeah the Cook fenestrated endograft. And so you, um, you took the measurements and, and ordered it? And so we, ordered we actually had it custom made in Australia, you know, with two small fenestrations, one for the SMA, one for the left renal. And our intention was to cover the right renal, but then the day before when I was reviewing all this, I had the idea, well, why not try that? You know, we we have experience with snorkels, and I figured this should work. <laughs> it was a good renal artery, the downslope of the artery, you know, it was, it was sort of waiting for us to do it, I thought. But you had an ideal angulation out there. I, ideal angulation, yeah. So how do you do your snorkels, Dr. Uh, Jones? Do you, uh, what stent, do you use the same stent, or do you use the same uh, snorkel all the time, or how, how, do, you, how, how do you decide? You know, as you well know, this is kind of a very, very complex anatomy. So uh, and the patients that we see uh, that uh, would warrant this type of therapy are generally very, very complicated cases. So I never say always for everything. <laughs> but generally speaking, uh, when I do make the decision to proceed with snorkeling, uh, my actual chimney or snorkeling uh, stents, uh, my first 
uh, choice would be the atrium, uh, balloon expandable, uh, stent, and secondarily, I might use a viabond depending upon the uh, acute angulation uh, of the takeoff vessel. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, bifurcated endoprostheses, um, my first choice would be the Gore uh, device, um, but I have used the other ones as well. Good. Do we have time for a second one or a quick one? Sure, absolutely. Okay, this what was about uh, your choice, Mark, uh, as far as Viabon versus ICAS? Uh, I like to use the Viabon just because I like the flaring in the renal artery and then I reinforce with a, either a balloon expandable, but not an atrium. You can actually use a balloon expandable stand in the gutter. So I've been using in the past, I've done about 60 to 70. Um, I call them parallel endografts uh, because it, chimney, snorkel, whatever you want to call it. But parallel endografts, either cotted or cephalite, that's how I personally call it, it makes more sense. But uh, <clears throat> I've been using Viben before, but you always, almost always have to reinforce them because on the top, you know, if you are more than a centimeter above the graft, they can fall over or they can fish mouth and so on. And I had a case where there was thrombosis. So I've been using ICAST almost exclusively nowadays because I don't have to reinforce them. It's less work. And uh, actually, uh, I place them diagonally. So there is no severe kink or bending at the origin of the uh, renos. And so that works very well for me. I don't have to reinforce them. So you, you're not concerned about the torquing sometimes of the, uh, depending on the sloping of the renal artery, that the rigidity of the stent may actually torque the, uh, the renal artery and create a problem? I, I have not had, but uh, you know, if I have a severe angulation of the renal, then I'll use a Viaband and I'll reinforce it. But most of the time I've been using ICAST. I do use Viabans in the iliacs, internal iliacs. Uh, but uh, that, that's my approach, and I've had very good results with it. Good. That's interesting uh, because uh, Dr. Bavada, who has the sandwich technique, uh, who has the sandwich technique, um, he, he uh, reinforces almost on a routine basis. So it's interesting that you can get away with this uh, without that. So. Should I do one more? It's up to you. We still take two minutes if, Go ahead. if you want Go ahead. to. So this was a 73-year-old man with bilateral common iliac aneurysms and bilateral internal iliac artery aneurysms, large aneurysms. And the issue with this guy is that he had a history of bladder cancer that in 2003 he underwent a neobladder reconstruction. So we really felt that his internal iliac supply had to be, had to be preserved. So this is the uh, angiogram on him. You can see that his uh, common iliacs on the right side was about four centimeters, very large on the left, and uh, the um, internal iliac artery aneurysm on the right side went all the way to the bifurcation into the posterior and the anterior division. So do you have uh, any comments about how to do this and try to preserve? So basically, bilateral common iliac artery aneurysms bilateral internal iliac artery aneurysm, and a neobladder reconstruction. So we felt that we had to preserve at least, you know, one of the uh, internal iliac artery. And uh, he was not a candidate for preserve, obviously, because of the internal iliac aneurysm. So what, what we did is we used a, uh, the high post snorkel technique which is basically snorkeling the left internal iliac artery. And the best graft, I think, to do this is to use an endologix graft just because it sits on the bifurcation and then you have that option that you can actually you know, go over. So we delivered the device from the right side. Uh, you can see that we have a 12 French sheaths there on the, on the left. And then uh, what I did is I placed the wires to be snared above the the graft so that you don't have to interfere with the stand struts, you know, in the, uh, the area of the bifurcation. So we came down and we snared one of the wires. So now we had through through access from right to left. And over the uh, through through access, we drove uh, an eight French sheath. So from right to left, you can see that sheath has now been advanced contralaterally. Then through that sheath, 
we uh, used a small little you know, five French catheter to get access into the internal iliac artery, do a selective angiogram in the internal iliac artery just to confirm that there was a landing zone, uh, distal to the aneurysm, and then it took uh, two Viabond stents to actually cover it entirely. You know, there was a long, long uh, snorkel, ballooning the snorkel, and this is after the case. You can see that we don't have a leak, everything looks good. And on the follow-up, so this is a year afterwards, uh, not 2023, but this was uh, nine months afterwards. And he's, uh, you can see that the snorkel is, is really, uh, you know, well perfused and uh, all the aneurysms are, are, are fixed. So we, we literally covered the right internal iliac artery and then we snorkeled the left and he's done, he's done very well. I agree with you a thousand percent on that. I, uh, from every uh, respects and regards, uh, from the selection of which bifurcated endoprosthesis you use, uh, as well as again in this particular case, in light of the length and tortuosity of that hypogastric, uh, this is one case that I would have agreed I would use the Viabon on as well. Uh, one question though: uh, the right hypogastric that was aneurysmal as well, right? Yes, but the aneurysm went all the way to the bifurcation. You know, so there was no option to. So the question I would have, are you concerned about retrograde filling of that right internal iliac artery aneurysm and would you have coiled that? You know, we, I, that was, uh, yeah, we, we thought about it, but we also have in our series, we've done, we've, we, we've covered large internal iliac artery aneurysms like that. And even if you see a small little type two leak, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure it's all that significant unless your aneurysm were really to grow over time. But, you know, we were really more concerned about just underperfusing and cut off the perfusion to that, because it was a large, it was like, you know, 4.5 centimeters. And to embolize that, I mean, that's it's quite a challenge too, don't you think? That you'd need a, a lot of corals to do that. Would you have, uh, would you have coiled it? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I have had two cases of uh, rupture of the internal iliac artery aneurysm in this type of scenario five years after. So uh, actually one case was where this was done elsewhere, the patient was followed and uh, they thought it was a malignancy tumor, they actually biopsied it. <laughs> it was a biopsy, the internal iliac artery aneurysm that was rupturing, contained rupture. So then they said the patient to me and we're able to actually coil embolize it uh, via anterior approach with CT guidance. So they can rupture if you do it that way, but you were lucky here because I don't see the field. So you just have to follow it to make yeah, sure we it's follow not. him. Yeah. We'll follow him. But if he were to grow, then you'd have to sneak a catheter behind the graft and and how would what would you do then? You would coil it, right? Yeah, you'd have to get it, into it. We were able to get it anteriorly with anterior stick because it was low down and there was no bowel there. Thanks, Mark. Uh, those are some great cases, I think, uh, to present and share with the uh, audience here and certainly with the feedback from our expert panel. Um, I'm going to um, move forward in the interest of time here. Um, and Dr. Atcher, Charles Atcher, is he here? You want to come up and give your talk right now? So the, the schedule is flexing today. <laughs> right. Uh, pointer. Is this the pointer? Or is this to change it? Is this the slide changer that makes Right. No zeros. Hi, and uh, I get to speak to you before lunch, which I think is a good thing. Um, my name's Dr. Aker, I'm from the University of Wisconsin, and the topic I've been assigned today is type two endoleaks in EVAR, which uh, were alluded to by one of the previous, uh, in one of the previous sessions is not very important. So <laughs> we'll try and uh, talk about some things about type two endoleaks. One is the prevalence, the cause, the natural history, when to intervene, options for intervention, 
and how we should think about them. So the prevalence and cause. Uh, 15, uh, the, the prevalence is variable depending on who you read. Um, I looked at two papers, one by Siri. These are recent papers uh, in 2014 and Ward also published this year. Uh, both sort of looked at different things. Series um, had 14, over 1,400 patients, a uh, series from uh, 1998 uh, to 2010, and his incidence was 15%. Um, the uh, wards was 30%, but that was an x-ray review paper where they looked uh, to discover type 2 endoleaks, so they were looking maybe harder. Um, so depending on how hard you look, perhaps, will determine how many you find. And some are quite obvious, actually. If you look at the cause, it's from patent lumbar or IMA, and some people say branch renal arteries, but, you know, backflow from branch renal branch renal arteries is pretty meager. And I think the contribution of that to a real if type 2 endoleak is pretty low. Uh, but it's clear that the number of open intercost uh, uh, lumbar arteries and open IMAs uh, correlates with the probability of developing a type 2 endoleak. And this is uh, uh, a, from a Ward's paper, which was on the e anatomy of type 2 endoleaks. And as you can see, the more, um, the more uh, open lumbar arteries, the higher the risk of type 2 endoleak up to uh, a risk of almost 50% if you have a lot open. If you look at their multivariate analysis, it's clear that if you have occluded lumbar arteries in an IMA, your risk is quite low, as indicated by the odds ratio, compared to if you have open vessels where the odds ratio shows a greatly increased risk, which is statistically significant. So how does type 2 endoleak play in long-term survival? That's a little more difficult to define. Here's the um, survival curve of the over trial, which is probably the most closely watched um, endovascular group of patients. And uh, the conclusion of this uh, trial, which was a VA cooperative trial, was that um, EVAR and OPEN had about uh, the same survival curves. EVAR perhaps was a little better. Uh, but out to eight years, they have follow-up uh, without a, a much apparent effect. However, if you look at the cumulative probability of uh, death or secondary procedures, those curves start to diverge around uh, five years. And I think that has uh, some important implications. So if you look at um, the outcomes in those patients, uh, it's clear that open repair carried higher initial mortality, as you would expect. Uh, the, however, the late mortality, uh, and that difference was statistically significant, the late mortality, the late incidence of rupture was much higher in the uh, EVARs, and that difference was statistically significant. Also, the EVARs had uh, a lot more late procedures done that were aneurysm related, and uh, the number of hospitalizations that was, were aneurysm-related uh, was much higher. Even though they weren't statistically significantly higher, uh, it was clearly obvious. So what happens if we look at the rupture rate? Um, in Ceres report, uh, which was uh, 1,400 patients, the rupture rate was about 1.2 percent. In Letterly's report, it was about 1.4 percent. In Siri estimated, that 25% uh, of the ruptures that they saw were from type 2 endoleaks. So it's comparable rupture rates. You can maybe assume that uh, laterally in the over trial was probably about the same. And the median time uh, to rupture was 55 months. And if we go back and look at those, uh, if you can remember that curve, that's when we start to see the, the um, survival procedure curve start to 
separate. The intercortical range was 42 to 76 months. So what about aneurysm growth? Well, it turns out that patients with type 2 endoleaks have a much greater risk of uh, aneurysm growth, and this is significant, and it increases with time, the slope of the curve and the incidence, as shown in this um, uh, graph, which was generated from some series data. And the cause of that growth is probably the pressure uh, in the aneurysm sac itself. And this is old data from uh, intrasac measurements, which were done translumbar um, by uh, Diaz back in 2004. And as you can see, and they're represented as uh, a percentage of aortic pressure, so this 19% is 19% of aortic pressure measured at the same time, 30% and 56%, and they correlated that with shrinking aneurysms, stable aneurysms, and increasing aneurysms, and this is the absolute millimeters of mercury that they measured when they did that. So the higher the pressure in the sac, clearly um, the more likely they are to expand. And the problem is, is that even though we do interventional procedures to um, occlude some of those lumbars and the IMA, uh, and those procedures are successful, even in the successful ones, the aneurysms in many of the patients continue to grow. And in uh, his serious conclusion was that actually the, the rate of growth, although it may change a little bit, it continues at about the same proportion of patients that whether you did no intervention at all. So how does this lead up to conversion? So in series and Letterly's uh, group, the conversions are about the same. And you have to remember these, uh, one's a, a randomized trial and one is just a, a, a very great personal experience or institutional experience. But the conversion rate um, is about the same. So they're uh, probably reacting to the same cues, which is the sac becomes big enough and they start to worry about it, and it's the sac that grows. And the freedom from conversion stays, um, increases over time. This is at six months, or 36 months. You can see the conversion rate for endoleak patients uh, is, um, is much higher than it is, uh, 60 months is the, this, is much higher than it is early at 36 months. So it does increase with time. And s again, up around five years is when we start to see that significant divergence. So this is a slide I put together of sort of summarizing that data. So we could get an idea of what really occurs in these patients who have type 2 endoleaks, and I think it'll it would be good to take a minute just to go through it. 15% uh, of the, oops, go back. How do I go back? This way? Yeah. 15% of the patients have endoleaks. Um, no growth occurs in about two-thirds of them. In about a third of them, growth occurs. In the ones that have no growth, a lot of them uh, seal spontaneously, and uh, some periodic leak continues, but it doesn't, the aneurysm doesn't continue to grow. Uh, in the ones that continue to grow, um, some seal, some spontaneously, some after treatment, but then there's a group that uh, persists and continues to grow. And if you look at the percentages, it's about um, the percentage, if you add it together, of those that are either converted or rupture. So, the math sort of adds up for those two. So what are the interventions that we do? Um, we observe them. We embolize preemptively, lumbars, IMA, embolize after surgery, SMA, hypogastric, translumbar, transcaval. We use cement, glue, laparoscopic ligation, open ligation, and explantation. Of course, I can't talk about all those in this time period, here's just an example of um, the uh, coiling of the IMA through the SMA branch. This one was fairly simple because it wasn't very tortuous, but it was successfully obliterated that. So what have we learned? 
Uh, we've learned that most common endoleaks occur, uh, type twos are the most common endoleak occurring in 15 to 30 percent. Aneurysm growth leading to intervention, conversion, or rupture in about 25 percent of the type two endoleaks patients, which is three to six percent of all EVARs. Endovascular interventions have a high failure rate and treated patients continue to have sac expansion. Um, it does not negatively affect uh, a survival compared to open repair, at least within the first several years. And uh, the ideal treatment algorithm still is elusive because of capriciousness of occurrence and the unpredictable behavior of the type 2 endoleaks. And that's sort of the summary I could put together. Thanks. Excellent presentation, Dr. Asher. Thank you very much. Okay, our next presentation uh, was supposed to be with Dr. Uh, Eskandari, but he's being uh, substituted by a very adequate uh, surgeon, Andy Hool. Andy, we look forward to your presentation. If EVAR is so great, when do we operate? Thanks for the opportunity to uh, come as a late uh, pinch hitter for Dr. Eskandari, who unfortunately was able to be here. So I, we both apologize for that, but I do thank you for the opportunity to give uh, this talk. So this is the, uh, the question, basically, is if EVAR is so great, and um, there's a lot of evidence that it is, when do we operate? Not why, but when. I have no disclosures, except to say that I, I am indeed an endovascular enthusiast, and so I don't want to color this conversation by saying I am a naysayer. I was actually very much appreciated the, the tour de force of uh, endovascular interventions presented in the cases uh, earlier in this session. Uh, with that said, I do think it's worth talking about open surgical repair because it is a standard of care for, um, you know, 50 years, essentially. Um, and um, in that context, I want to talk about the outcomes for open aneurysm repair and then talk a little about the medical indications and sort of call out the, the different things that I think are um, important to talk about related to the need for open repair. The primary medical indication that I'll, I'll touch on is infection, which um, endovascular therapy has not um, created a durable solution for. And then talk about the anatomic indications, which is really the the mainstay or the, the, I would say the focus of the things that we will uh, talk about today and I, I'll highlight some elements of EVAR failure which can provide a little lessons learned uh, type opportunity. So just to review uh, open aneurysm repair, it's been um, present in a similar form to how it's uh, performed now essentially since 1951. It involves a la uh, laparotomy, aortic cross clamp and it replaces directly the disease segment of the aorta. <clears throat> The outcomes have been studied um, in a number of trials. I think the most instructive for the purposes of this talk are those that compare endovascular to open repair. Three clinical trials have been uh, completed demonstrating short, um, publishing both short and long-term outcomes. And they basically uh, demonstrate that there's an early benefit to endovascular repair as far as all-cause survival is, uh, but that benefit is not sustained. So here's the early benefit and then that uh, is not sustained over the uh, long period uh, of time. These are uh, obviously randomized trials in patients with straightforward uh, anatomy, so it's a highly selected patient population. And there are multiple different elements of uh, criticism that come from different avenues regarding these trials, but it is an instructive um, opportunity to look at open repair um, in comparison to EVAR. If we step back from clinical trials, we can um, look at administrative data to think about sort of a real world, world perioperative outcomes for open versus uh, endovascular repair. And this reflects uh, similar data to those in the clinical trials. There is uh, a significant morbidity advantage in the short period of, in the short term uh, for EVAR over open repair. Mortality is lower, and this is a short term outcome, obviously. As we can uh, expect, length of stay is uh, also significantly shorter. Somewhat surprising, though, is that quality of life after a year in patients um, undergoing either of these procedures is roughly equivalent uh, based on this trial or this, uh, this review. Interestingly, you know, the, the question of comparing um, patients fit for either procedure is an important one, but really the question that we're looking at in the modern era of treatment is how do patients fare with complex anatomy? Complex aneurysm repair 
with a super anal co uh, cross clamp was uh, studied in this uh, paper, and it actually demonstrated excellent results. Two and a half percent 30 day mortality, 2% uh, long term graph related complications. So those are actually relatively uh, good results. And that Singer Central Center's uh, study demonstrated that open repair is actually a good operation and uh, demonstrates good outcomes. So let's talk about the sort of what I think about as the indications for open repair. Not the straightforward patient necessarily that could easily undergo EVAR, but in the medical sense, a patient who has an infected aorta. And this is a, a patient of our, from our service, a 68-year-old man who presented with back pain and fever. Blood cultures were positive for Staph aureus. And his CT is as shown here. There's a lot of uh, periaortic inflammation. Um, it's sort of a focal dissection with uh, degeneration of the aortic wall. And there is not really a uh, clear, durable uh, solution for this patient um, who apparently has a primary aortic infection. So in those patients, um, we have opted generally for cryopreserved uh, or cryopreserved allograft as an uh, option for treatment um, for a patient that eventually could be treated with, uh, could be off suppressive antibiotics and uh, lead a normal life subsequent to that. And um, that, that has been published in the past demonstrating relatively good results with a 7% mortality at one year. So that is actually a reasonable option for patients who have, um, for medical reasons, a not a good uh, endovascular treatment. I think the bulk of this um, issue, though, centers around the anatomic indications uh, for uh, endovascular repair or the need for open repair. So um, I'll just touch on these, and these are sort of uh, cases that I have seen in the past of the very rare indications for open repair, patients that generally have a hard time undergoing uh, endovascular repair. Those are patients such as those having a horseshoe kidney, an inferior mesenteric uh, artery dependent visceral circulation, meaning patients with a celiac and superior mesenteric artery occlusion, and the entire visceral uh, circulation is running off the IMA. And then lumbar artery dependent spinal cord circulation, often patients who have had coverage of the remainder of their uh, aorta, patients who have um, uh, subclavian uh, vertebral artery disease and hypogastric disease. That is, those are very rare things, and I only uh, mention them. Uh, I instead want to focus on um, the more common uh, indications for open repair. It's instructive to think about iliac disease because this is really uh, a feat of uh, technological advancement uh, over time. In the past, common iliac artery aneurysms, external iliac artery stenosis um, were um, problematic for endovascular repair. But with improvement in devices, be they bell-bottom limbs or uh, current trial devices with iliac branch devices, some of the snorkels and uh, chimneys that we've seen uh, presented today, um, these, um, this disease process and, uh, of common iliac disease is, is becoming more commonly treated in an endovascular fashion. Small diameter external iliac uh, arteries, which were previously a, a major issue for access, have also been um, dealt with in an endovascular fashion. So it rarely precludes uh, EVAR uh, with the options for an open or an endovascular conduit and also uh, newer low, lower profile devices that can allow um, uh, delivery of, uh, of uh, endovascular treatment across small external iliac arteries. So it's rare to require an open repair for isolated iliac artery disease from either of these, um, either of these avenues. So then we get to the more vexing problems of um, indications for open repair, the aortic neck and the proximal segment uh, for sites of fixation and seal. The short aortic neck uh, has been a vexing problem in this uh, for a lot of the same reasons we discussed. Suboptimal outcomes are associated with standard EVAR devices in patients who have a short um, reverse tapered aortic neck. That has been partially dealt with by advancing technology. Um, there's currently the Cook fenestrated device. Trivascular has a uh, shorter neck in indication, and there are multiple devices in uh, clinical trials that are being treated. So a patient like this who has a short neck can undergo um, treatment with a Cook fenestrated device, for example, um, and have uh, good uh, intermediate term outcomes based on clinical trial results. Significant tortuosity is another um, difficult problem, partially being dealt with endovascular devices, but there is still an element of this that uh, makes endovascular treatment very difficult. And again, suboptimal outcomes are associated with standard EVAR devices in this sort of anatomy. 
This just uh, are a number of demonstrations of that um, finding. This is a single center review of 565 EVARs that demonstrated the application outside the uh, IFU or instructions for use results in a negative effect on uh, late results. And this is from Mass General. This is another study demonstrating a similar finding that there's a significantly increased rate of early and late endoleak in patients uh, treated uh, with standard endovascular devices and in a short aortic neck. So these, often, these frequently require uh, repeat interventions. The largest um, sort of um, anatomic evaluation of this finding is uh, this paper done in 10,000 patients. Um, and this was a uh, patient or a group of patients enriched with complex anatomy um, that basically demonstrates treatment with an endovascular device um, has a higher rate of aneurysm enlargement after five years and worse outcomes, more rear interventions. Um, in patients that are planted Im with implantation outside of the um, instructions for use or recommended guidelines. So taking all of this together, uh, you think about can EVAR be done in complex anatomy? And the answer is yes, um, but there are consequences in the form of potential late adverse outcomes. Just to demonstrate a few cases uh, that I have, of uh, patients that I have seen, um, for example, this patient was uh, someone who had a uh, markedly diseased visceral segment aorta at the time of implantation that subsequently resulted in degen or sub subsequently had degeneration over uh, time, even with this large diameter uh, infrarenal aortic endograft, um, resulting in loss of seal, a type 1A endoleak. So diseased visceral segments with uh, degeneration over the long term uh, result in adverse outcome for this patient. And then this patient um, has a short aortic neck with an attempted treatment with um, a standard endograft of a large diameter to try and create a proximal seal. This unfortunately resulted in distal migration of the endograft. Now with that said, um, we dealt with this, um, this issue of short neck and tortuosity by implanting a zenith fenestrator device inside um, to uh, treat the type 1A endoleak. And so this is another example of advancement in technology. With that said, I do think there are still some patients who really deserve an open repair. Um, and I'll close with this uh, case presentation because I think the technology, while I firmly believe will in, uh, treat the majority of um, aortic disease from the left ventricle to the aortic bifurcation in the near future, I think there are some patients that really deserve open repair. This is a 72-year-old woman who underwent an EVAR, and as you can see, there were multiple re-interventions that uh, occurred, including proximal extension to try and obtain a proximal seal and placement of uh, endostaples uh, to try and uh, maintain or uh, preserve a, a proximal steel, uh, seal. And this, these are really uh, sort of heroic uh, attempts to save this endograft. But with that said, the patient was set up for uh, an adverse result um, at the beginning. She had a very small diameter visceral segment aorta, 17 millimeters. She had very small renal arteries, three and a half to four millimeters, making her a suboptimal candidate for a fenestrated endograft due to risk of uh, limb, um, limb uh, uh, or renal artery occlusion. So those things uh, taken together are, um, suggest that the patient probably deserves an open repair. Unfortunately, she underwent an open repair with EVAR explant and open reconstruction, although I would argue that her open repair was probably um, a good option in the beginning. And that is demonstrated here that uh, re-interventions uh, for explant um, have um, worse morbidity and mortality over time. So just to summarize, EVAR is great. You know, if EVAR is so great, yes, it is great. Standard of, it's a standard of care for patients with straightforward anatomy. Open repair is very good. It has excellent long-term results. And it uh, does present a greater perioperative risk potentially for recovery. The majority of decisions I think are made uh, appropriately so, based on the anatomic suitability of the available endovascular devices. And when I think about planning an endovascular case, I think about uh, the moment when I wonder, is this going to work? And then that is the moment when I reconsider my uh, strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last presentation is going to be given by Dr. Paul Jones, and uh, he's going to be conquering zone zero. <laughs> I don't know about conquering it, but we're certainly going there because unfortunately our patient presents that pathology to us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, once again, we apologize for the 
morning being uh, not as organized and moving it and flowing as smooth as we like, but we had some, again, unexpected cancellation. So I've been spending the morning trying to pull this case together, and I thought that, um, gosh, we would be incredibly remiss if we didn't take advantage of uh, having uh, such an esteemed uh, faculty like Dr. Dietrich and Dr. Crazier and Dr. Maya out there and some of the other guys uh, to share with them cases like this and uh, as a result of that share with you um, how to manage uh, uh, these very, very complicated cases. So uh, again, I'm working in a community hospital in a uh, uh, patient population that's uh, kind of uninsured, underserved if you will, uh, and this is what shows up on our door. Uh, <clears throat> it began uh, with a 38-year-old gentleman who had no prior medical history. He has a nice, lean body habitus, plays basketball, physically very, very active. He shows up at the emergency room with chest pain. He has some, uh, basically some nonspecific findings on his 12E electrocardiogram. And uh, lo and behold, the subsequent workup revealed that he had this large pseudoaneurysm uh, involving his mid left anterior descending coronary artery. It measured about seven centimeters in diameter at that point in time. Uh, we can certainly, you know, have a half hour debate on how to manage this, uh, but to the interest of time, uh, we decided to manage this patient with conventional surgery because of his young age, relatively low risk. Uh, he underwent successful uh, single vessel uh, aortic coronary bypass graft surgery with resection of that pseudoaneurysm. He did very, very well. Um, at least we didn't see him again until he comes back to the emergency room uh, three years later uh, with complaints of severe right lower extremity pain and discomfort while he was playing basketball. Uh, subsequently, he's found to have an acute deep vein thrombosis. And as part of that evaluation was to rule out concomitant pulmonary embolic disease. He had a CTA of his chest. And lo and behold, it reveals a significant lesion involving the ascending thoracic aortic aneurysm that kind of looks like that. I apologize for that movie on the right, but I thought the AV guys had gotten that turned around. But as you can see, there is a pseudoaneurysm involving the ascending thoracic aorta. Um, oh, uh, probably about one, two, three, four centimeters above the uh, uh, aortic cusp there. And uh, it measured about eight centimeters on CT. So I'm going to take a minute right now, since we've got all these experts in the room, and uh, just kind of get a quick poll um, uh, from our experts in terms of how to manage this. We discussed this internally at our institution with our cardiac surgeons. And I'm going to take off the table the fact that this patient has no insurance and whether or not that had an impact on the surgeon's decision to do one thing versus another. But um, purely from a clinical perspective, uh, Zonko, by the way, Dr. Crazier, when I showed this him, case to him, he showed me one very, very similar. So I'm going to open it up with you, Zonko. So what is the diameter of the aorta? On CT, the pseudoaneurysm, it's Aorta. The diameter of the aorta itself on CT was about 24 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this could probably be treated with one of the aortic cuffs, but the problem is that uh, available abdominal aortic grafts, the um, delivery system is uh, too short, and he's a basketball player, so I assume he's not five foot two. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that would be therefore out of question to get from the groin there unless you use some other route. So you could use um, thoracic cuffs, and uh, the problem with thoracic cuffs are none of them are really designed to be short enough for that segment. Most of them are 10 centimeters in length. The only one that's shorter is uh, Zenith XT that's um, 8 centimeters in length. So you. That, that could be used. I would say that would work pretty well in this type of a scenario. You would have to do a rapid pacing or something else to reduce the blood pressure. And uh, that's probably what I would do. Ted, you want to comment at all? You've been uh, all over the world training everyone. <laughs> well, first question I had uh, when you mentioned this case to me, what's the etiology of this? Uh, because we have a series of these where we have uh, treated them 
uh, and we have seen uh, a problem at the anastomosis. We've seen the de-airing site. Uh, so there are a lot of different uh, reasons for this. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Krasier, uh, and one of the things you th think about here is uh, probably the nose cone on any of the graphs uh, is, is going to be too long. And you don't want to interfere with the aortic valve there. So if you may have to customize and, and uh, eliminate the, the nose cone or make a short graph, but you're going to have to do something in terms of you don't have any any uh, commercial product that you're going to have to you're going to have to modify something. Uh, Vinky, I know you want to get in on this, so go ahead. We've done a few of these uh, endographs uh, <laughs> through the carotid and through the anomalous and stuff like that, but. One option is an amplat supply. And uh, Dr. Dietrich has done a couple of these where the neck of that pseudoaneurysm is probably very, very small, and you can just seal this with an amplat supply. So uh, again, in the interest of time, uh, uh, there is no uh, approved devices, so everything we do here is clearly off-label. After discussion with our surgeons and what have you, as well as with the patient, uh, uh, we decided to uh, proceed with a uh, endograph and to Dr. Krasier's point, really you have to modify uh, one of the graphs. Even the Cook device, which is eight centimeters, would have been too long if you looked at my first image <coughs> with the length, uh, as we're determined with the uh, graduated pigtail, that eight centimeters would have been too long. And God knows in this young guy, we didn't want to compromise uh, the anominate circulation and certainly not the coronary circulation. So we were able to modify that graft and it basically shorten it from eight centimeters down to four. And it was done fairly easily in the lab. So we were able to accomplish that and uh, basically deliver that uh, percutaneously. And uh, uh, we were able to seal this up uh, nicely uh, again, all done percutaneously. We did a pharmacologic arrest of the heart with the denosine. Uh, the placement was very, very accurate. We didn't compromise the cerebral circulation, nor the coronary circulation. And this guy actually did well and uh, uh, went home the next morning and this continues to do well. This was a very, very recent case. So I think uh, this just highlights where we're going with this. And Dr. Uh, Dietrich touched on it this morning. So I thought this particular case was a nice follow-up to his discussion this morning uh, to letting you know that, man, we have come a long way with the management of aortic pathology, and we are continuing to go down that path. Um, and if you can imagine that this particular lesion can be done pretty much in a patient that's in and out of the hospital in 23 hours, I think says a lot to where we have come and all the work of the pioneers like Dr. Dietrich, Dr. Krasier, and these guys have brought us to the, today. So I think, once again, that just highlights the gratitude of uh, uh, their prior work and, and where we are today. Um, so with that, any final comments? And then I think we're going to break for the lunch session. All right. Uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, this particular Zenit XT, even though it's eight centimeters long, two centimeters unco it's uncovered. So distal it would be uncovered. So it would be probably all right to put it there. Another thing is if you go into the LV, it's no big deal to go with a nose cone. We do that during TAVR all the time. So you pass the wire in there, and then you go and uh, deploy the, the stent graph. So as far as the amplitude, yeah, certainly that's, that's another good option, definitely. Uh, so it's your choice, whatever you want to do. All right, thank you. Dr. Maya, one final comment? What is the etiology? What was the etiology of his LAD aneurysm? That's a good question. We went back and forth with that because to be honest with you, we still weren't comfortable with the etiology of that first aneurysm he came uh, involving the LAD. Uh, you try to create a case for trauma, but I didn't buy it. In this particular case, um, uh, we thought that this was the proximal anastomosis of the vein graft to this LAD, which was down on subsequent angiography, and what we found that this is probably just an aneurysmal degeneration of that vein graft. Any other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>